thank you everyone for having joined um, today. Um, I'm looking forward to present you uh, some of um, the work that I'm doing within the Multimind project and mainly also along with my uh, thesis advisor, Maria Lu Luisa Lorusso. So um, I'll jump right into what is what motivated us um, to carry out this project. And we know from a study by Lito and colleagues from 2018 um, that children of, children of migrants are more likely to have diagnosis of developmental disorders related to speech, language, um, compared to children of parents without migratory background. At the same time, we find evidence in the literature about the fact that bilingualism per se is not a risk factor for a de developmental language disorder, so DLD, or developmental dyslexia, DD. So what might be the reason for this divergency? Uh, in the literature, it is argued that there's a bias in the evaluation of language performance of bilingual children. And I would like to dig a little bit deeper into this um, so-called diagnostic dilemma that we are confronted with. So we refer to identification of language and reading disorders in bilingual children is um, somehow complex. In the first place, it is important, but not easy to reliably identify the risk of DD and DLD in bilingual children. And why is that? When we observe language errors in bilingual children, we don't know whether those could result from variation in language acquisition due to bilingual input, or whether language or reading acquisition is actually impaired due to DLD or DD. So accurate diagnosis requires a holistic view on the child that needs to be assessed. So um, there's the need to collect background information on the child's general and language development, and also ideally the assessment in both languages spoken by the child. But of course, um, not all speech and language therapists do speak all the languages of their um, bilingual clients. So, since the assessment of both languages is so difficult to realize, um, this diagnostic um, dilemma results in a high risk of misdiagnosis, meaning overdiagnosis in cases in which a child with a weak language performance in the language in which it is assessed, uh, but high language performance in the other language is mistaken as a subject, for example, of DLD. Whereas under, under diagnosis refers to a circumstance in which a child is not provided speech and language therapy services because the language problems it shows are thought to be resulting from bilingualism. So that's the, the situation um, that we're in. But um, actually in the literature and also in policy papers, we find some clear indications and re recommendations uh, for language assessment in bilingual children. Um, so as mentioned earlier, it's recommended um, to assess all languages spoken by the child. All these language um, knowledge should be taken into account. And this can happen um, by the means of an interpreter. Um, so an interpreter being present in the, in the uh, language assessment session um, or simply through the knowledge of the speech and language therapist on clinical marks in the uh, L1 and awareness for cross-linguistic influence. Um, also, this information uh, on the L1 can be just generally taken into account, um, for example, by interviewing the caregivers. Um, and doing this, um, the exposure to the majority language or the L2 can be determined um, looking at the exposure over time. Depending on this um, L2 exposure, it can be, but in most cases it's not um, useful to use a standardized um, test, even though it only provides monolingual norms. But the general uh, recommendation in the poly policy papers we find is that um, no monolingual normative data should be used and also um, 
it is mentioned that culture fair materials, so appropriate um, audio or um, picture content should be used. Um, lastly, there is the need of adequate um, training for teachers, educators, and clinicians, so everyone who's involved in um, assessing or knowing about the language performance of bilingual children. So now we know um, what the policy papers recommend. Um, and I'd also like to show you a few studies um, that um, determine to uh, show us what the common practice in terms of speech and language therapy services and um, children, bilingual children. So um, unlike what was said in the policy papers, um, speech, and therapy, uh, speech and language therapists have highlighted that there's no or only limited access to interpreters. So actually it's a good recommendation to involve them, but it seems to be not so easy. Um, but still, even though there's not the possibility to, um, to involve interpreters as much as, as it would be needed, 50% um, of the SLPs who responded to Bintrop um, et al's um, survey said that they do take um, the L1 language development into account. And in order to do that, 95%, so the uh, majority, uh, uses information obtained in a case history interview with the caregivers. Um, then, uh, relating back to the notion on um, training um, for the training on multilingualism and speech and language therapy, um, only 3% of the respondents feel adequately prepared for the training or studies to work with multilingual children. So that's a very, very low number. And 80% um, consider multilingualism to be very little or not at all taken into account in their training and study. So I'd just like to highlight here that this study is already 10 years old. So let's hope things have changed. But even in a more recent study um, by Marinova Tot et al., and also in the study already mentioned from 2011, um, most of the respondents um, said that they used tests and norms of children um, monolingual in the majority language. And interestingly, in Marinova taught at a study, it is um, said that the respondents, knowing that they um, should not use this practice, they generally disagreed with this practice, but still they obviously <laughs> did not know what else to do. And so they assessed and treated uh, the bilingual children in the majority language only. So looking at these um, findings, uh, we were wondering what the current situation um, was like in Italy, um, where Maria Luisa Lorusso and I work. And um, we wanted to know about whether there's also this gap between opinion or knowledge and the common practice. So we created an online survey for uh, speech and language therapists um, ourselves. And um, then this questionnaire um, that originated uh, here in Italy was translated also to German. And uh, along with my colleagues, um, Teresa Loda and Tanja Rinka, we also recruited um, SLPs in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria who filled in this questionnaire. The questionnaire focused on the assessment and intervention in the context of developmental language disorders. And um, it was an inclusion criteria that the response The question we added, we asked them whether they already had um, obtained uh, experience with bilingual children. And in total, it was quite a short questionnaire that contained of 21 multiple choice questions. And I'd like to show you a few of the results. So um, here we saw um, significant differences um, between the different countries where we have um, carried out um, a study. But um, we see that um, in all countries, the majority of um, respondents thinks that different approaches are needed in the diagnosis and treatment of multilingual children compared to monolingual children. So that's something um, we've seen uh, in all countries. 
So that is in line also with, with what we've seen in the policy papers. And then uh, we were asking them uh, whether they think that uh, the, uh, the first language of the child should be taken um, into account or whether it is sufficient to only look at majority or society, a societal language. And there were no significant difference between the countries and level of experience. But again, um, predominantly, it is considered relevant to take the child's first and family language into account. So this confirms with, uh, what we've seen in the, in the previous questionnaire studies. Um, more specifically, across countries, again, there was no significant difference across the countries, we do see that the majority of SLPs considers the comparison of language proficiencies in all languages spoken useful. So again, uh, this is in line with policy papers, and more specifically, they also think it's useful to compare the language performance. But then if we look at whether um, the SLPs who participated in our question also use special diagnostic materials or tools for multilingual children with DLD. The majority all over in all countries uh, said that they do not uh, use special diagnostic materials, um, which again uh, uh, confirms the fact that there's a gap between the opinion and the common practice. Um, I'd like to um, show you now some results only from the Italian SLPs, um, because here we see some connection between the level of experience uh, and the knowledge on diagnostic um, materials uh, that are dedicated for multilingual children. So um, here the, the SLPs with the most experience are the ones who know most tools and materials for the assessment of bilingual children. And also, um, um, we kind of see a similar picture when we ask them about whether they use uh, special diagnostic materials. So um, in the group um, with the most experience of treatment of uh, bilingual children, there's the smallest proportion of um, SLPs who said that they have not ever used such diagnostic material. Okay, then back to our whole sample and all the SLPs we asked um, to fill in this questionnaire across countries. We asked them whether they think, so you already know about uh, our project from the title of this presentation. Uh, so we asked them, do you think that computerized tasks uh, to assess the level of proficiency in, child's, um, in the child's other language would be helpful. And um, just uh, in all um, levels of experience, they agreed that it would be useful to use computerized tasks. And they also said that they would use and apply these tasks if they existed. Okay, here we could think, okay, um, there are some things, why do they now say they would use it, but there's already some things on the market that they don't use, but okay, this is another topic, but this was just to um, uh, start um, the presentation on the computerized tasks that we are actually constructing and validating uh, within the project. So, um, we saw SLPs are open um, to use computerized tasks for the assessment, and those could potentially contribute to a solution for the problem regarding the assessment of bilingual children, because automatically administered bilingual children do not require the knowledge of um, the child's L1. It's still it's possible to uh, get an impression about uh, what the language performance in the first language is like. In that case, predefined um, testing paradigms need to be chosen, which allow for accuracy and reaction time to be measured automatically. Um, we have already, through the study by Vigali and Lorusso, carried out in 2014, some experience 
on these um, testing paradigms and that they are actually useful because they used um, computerized tasks to assess reading and language skills in Mandarin and Italian in bilingual children from China attending schools in Italy. And they found correlations between experimental and standardized reading tests. And this shows that computerized screenings do help in the risk detection of language or reading difficulties. And based on these findings, we then seek um, to create um, user-friendly and accessible solution. And this is why in collaboration with colleagues from Polytechnico Milan, uh, we constructed a screening platform, a web application that can be assessed through any internet browser. And, um, this screening pl platform is called Moolini and provides interfaces for test construction, participant management, and of course, testing. Um, so as mentioned earlier, so we have um, different target users. Um, in the end, uh, we have the administrator who is in charge of the screening development. And then there's the clinicians um, who carry out the screenings um, which here we refer to as the screening uh, application. And through the um, automatic analysis, then um, the, the test results lead to a recommendation of either refer for uh, SAT services or language enhancement. In, in a little bit more detail, uh, that means that um, the admins create subtests by uploading um, stimuli and um, create the tests. And um, this modular structure encourages also, the, well, of course, the construction of new um, tasks, but also allows the implementation of previously developed um, testing material. Um, then um, there is this family and a child uh, that needs to be um, tested in both languages spoken and the clinician creates a participant profile, um, inserts the domestic data, the screening is started and the child uh, performs the screening. Um, the, either the clinician or the examiner is present uh, while the child does the screening or it can also be carried out remotely. Then once the screening is completed, the clinician or the examiner can check the results and uh, give a recommendation accordingly. So that's the structure here, just to give you an, an impression of what this looks like. Uh, this is the interface for the administrator to upload and modify items, create tasks and screenings. This is where the examiner um, accesses the examinee profile and can check the screening um, scores. So this is for the screening scores. Also the screening scores can be downloaded. Um, and as you see here, we have implemented some gamification tools and also instructions can be delivered in a video in the L1 of the child. So just to give you a, a short impression on how in general we um, wanted to construct uh, and have constructed the screenings um, that are implemented on, on the screening platform. So. Um, for each language pair that we want to create screenings for, um, the L1 and the L2 are tested in two different parts. And due to this language specificity, there are some tasks and linguistic domains that are tested in both languages, and some are tested only in one of the languages. Um, so for example, um, in the Italian-German reading, um, phonological awareness is only um, is tested in Italian and German, but reading is only tested in German since this is the language of instruction of the child. And then, as we know, clinical markers um, are also specific to languages. So um, that means that in, in, in Italian, it's relevant to use um, uh, clitic pronouns as clinical markers, but in German or English, clitic pronouns don't exist, so there's other clinical markers um, to use. Regarding the item construction, we established parameters for comparability of items between languages, despite varying exposure and controlled uh, the items for word frequency and age of acquisition. 
um, our target populations here, you see that um, there's two um, different screening types that we develop, one for um, kindergarten children aged um, between four and six years old and primary school children aged seven to nine years old. Um, the, the target populations are uh, children who are um, either simultaneous or early sequential bilinguals. Prior to formal reading acquisition, as mentioned, for the children who are uh, four to six attending kindergarten or seven to nine years old, so second, third grade attending um, the primary school. They should be all exposed to their L2 for a minimum two years. And um, there's three different um, groups that we're looking at. So children who are typically developing, children who are at risk of DLD or DD or who have a diagnosis. So um, just to give you a brief overview of what in general the, the DLD of screening looks like. So it contains a subtask of non-word repetition. Um, we test morphosyntactic processing skills and uh, we use the cross-linguistic lexical tasks, the CLTs that were developed by um, Harman and many colleagues um, within the BZ cost action. So this is one example of how uh, we can also um, apply or uh, implement exercises, tasks, material that have been um, developed and evaluated already previously to this modifiable um, screening platform. And there's also a task on dynamic novel word learning. Whereas for the um, developmental dyslexia screening, uh, we have tasks on uh, rapid optimized uh, naming, reading, um, both um, reading, reading time and reading accuracy, phonological awareness, multiple syntactic processing again as earlier. And this time we have a dynamic reading assessment. Um, so a new script that the, the child is um, supposed to learn. Um, and then instructions are given in the, in the majority language. Um, for the screening validation, uh, we uh, will test discriminant validity and criterion val validity through the comparison of at-risk and non-at-risk groups. We'll measure convergent and concurrent validity through tests that are declared to be measuring the same construct and therefore uh, we are uh, trying to choose uh, validated uh, and useful tests. We'll test the content validity through the correlations between the L1 and L2 performance and the predictive value through color correlations of screening performance with future achievements indicated by teachers and therapists and uh, also follow-up studies to find out about the persistence um, of the differences. So now, I'd like to um, present you um, this study on Italian German kindergarten children uh, with whom we carried out our screening for the DLD risk identification. As mentioned earlier, the, the participants were all simultaneous, simultaneous or early sequential bilinguals speaking Italian and German, Italian as their first language and having um, lived in Germany for at least two years. The children were between three years and 10 months and six years and one month old. And as I said earlier, based on um, tests and caregiver and educator or um, therapist questionnaires, um, we group those children into those three different groups. So either having a diagnosis of DLD because they're already uh, receiving treatment, um, like speech and language therapist for DLD, or typically developing or at risk of DLD, which for us we defined as um, scoring below cutoff in at least one of the language tests that we've um, carried out with the children. Okay, so um, according to the structure that I've already introduced to you of the DLD screening, so non-word repetition processing of multiple syntactic features and uh, the word compre comprehension and the CLTs, we chose standardized tests. So to compare the performance in non-word repetition and our experimental non-word um, non repetition, which is the Mottier test, which is a German standardized um, test for non-word repetition, the LISA-DATS 
which is again a German standardized test um, for production and processing um, of grammar. But and this test um, also provides bilingual norm data. Um, this is why we we chose this test. And then there's the PBBT, which is uh, again a German standardized um, lexicon test. So. Um, now I'll show you the preliminary results on the non-word repetition task uh, we have implemented on uh, Wulimi. Now you see this little um, black square, which is um, the universe. And uh, just to illustrate how the children, uh, what the children see during our non-word repetition task. So after each non-word they have repeated, um, a um, there's an additional planet that is visualized on the screen or um, in another set of uh, non-words, it is um, the, the color that, it, that is added after each non-word the child um, repeats. Um, the scoring of the repetition uh, performance cannot yet happen automatically on the platform through automatic speech recognition. So um, the performance is um, scored by the, the examiner. Um, and these are the results for a sample of 18 children of which four have a DLD diagnosis, seven belong um, to the risk group since they scored below cutoff in at least one of the standardized tests that I explained earlier. The children's repetition performance significantly correlates with the risk factor and performance in the standardized Mottier test. Um, um, so we see that our Moulini non-word repetition test um, can help to identify the risk um, of developmental language disorder. Those results were then confirmed on a larger sample of um, 33 children. And I'll turn um, to, the re to the more detailed results in a bit, but um, to be able to do this, I would first like to um, say a few words about how we constructed, rated, and selected um, the, those language specific and unspecific um, non words that we implemented in our Moodini non word repetition class. Um, so we created non words that were recorded by native speakers um, of the language. And we decided to create language specific non words since they seem less artificial and more natural. But um, working with bilingual children, we need to bear in mind that the performance on language specific non words might also depend on the exposure to a certain language. And of course, this varies in bilingual children. So we decided to also use language unspecific non words. And also the language on universal non-words or language unspecific non-words were recorded by speakers of a certain language. And then later on, creating like uh, the final task, um, for example, German Italian speaking would hear half of the language unspecific non-words that were recorded by an Italian native speaker and half of the language universal non-words that were recorded by a German native speaker. So this about the construction and um, item recording. Then there was a two-step um, rating procedure. So in order to, de to, to determine the degree of language specificity or language specific uh, and unspecific non-words we created. Um, and we asked the, the native speakers when recording the language unspecific non-words, to not put a word stress and to equally stress um, all the syllables. So for each language, we were able to retrieve a sufficient number of language specific non-words that according to the raters seem to belong to a certain language, even though they do not exist in the language and don't have a meaning. But the language unspecific items we tried to create um, in the end were not consistently rated as language unspecific by our writer. So some of the non-words were rated as being language unspecific, but some of the language unspecific non-words well, that we thought were language unspecific non-words were perceived as belonging to the own language. Another interesting um, finding is that uh, we found significant differences in how speakers from different variants of uh, language rated the non-words, for example, 
German speakers from Austria versus um, speakers from Germany rated uh, the non-words or the, the specificity of the German language specific non-words in a different way. In the next step, we will determine um, the discriminative value of each non-word based um, on the child's repetition performance and make an item selection based on that accordingly. So that was the parenthesis on the, on the construction of the screening. And here I'd like to continue sharing um, the results on the screening that we've, that we've carried out. So um, as said earlier, uh, we have a bigger sample here that confirmed the results. And also um, those um, results uh, were confirmed when we saw that the, the we found significant correlations also with the follow-up scores that we collected um, eight to 12 months uh, after the first evaluation. Here we see um, again that the repetition performance increases with decreasing risk level. So um, two, um, in level two, these are the children who have a diagnosis and who are treated for DLD. And uh, we see that they significantly perform poorest compared to, for example, the ship um, who are at risk or who are typically developing. Uh, typically developing. Um, now um, I'd like to um, go to the next subtext of our DLD screening. Um, and this is the German um, case marking. So in German, um, the articles uh, are marked um, for case and um, there's also a different meaning that comes with it. So on the left picture, we see a donkey um, that is walking inside or into the room. Um, so we, it's in das Zimmer. And uh, on the other picture, we see a donkey who's walking inside the room. Um, and so this is the task that the child needs to do. It sees the, the two pictures, but uh, listens uh, or hears only one of the sentences and needs to indicate uh, which is the corresponding picture. And also here uh, we see that the matching performance increases with a decreasing risk level. And also the Mulimi case marking performance, um, which is a receptive task, significantly correlates with the productive case marking that we tested using uh, the German standardized test Lisedas. Um, as mentioned before, also the child's lexicon was tested using the CLTs. Um, and these results again uh, are on the sample of the 33 children. And also here we found that the scores significantly correlate with the DLD risk factor as well as with the results in the standardized um, PBT. So that um, was everything on the preschool screening. Now we will move to the reading screening. And also um, this one we um, used already with Italian German speaking um, children attending primary schools in Germany. Uh, we have a sample of um, 27 simultaneous and early sequential Italian German bilinguals um, who have already acquired basic reading and writing skills. So they're aged between seven and nine attending second and third grade um, German primary schools. They've been living in Germany for at least um, two years. And also there we carried out um, language tests and asked caregivers and teachers to fill in questionnaires to find out about their language development. Um, there are 24 children who are typically developing and three children uh, with um, dyslexia risk or diagnosis. Also here, um, we have carried out standardized tests, uh, more specifically German and in, in German and Italian, and they were all on word and non-word reading accuracy and um, reading speed. So concerning this, the overall structure of the dyslexia screening for Italian German bilinguals, so this contained a task on a rapid automatized naming 
um, self-paced reading tasks um, and uh, reading um, speed and accuracy for words and non-words. Also part on phonological in awareness, um, this time again for both languages spoken, so German and Italian. And the processing of grammatical features, again, we see case for German, but also agreement and politics um, that I also mentioned earlier for Italian. So here we see some graphs on um, reading time. So on the y-axis, we see the standardized um, test score on the left side for Italian and on the right side for German. And on the x-axis, we always see um, the the reading time measured in our experimental Mulini screening. And we do see um, correlations between um, both measures. And we also see that our three uh, DD or at-risk cases are the outliers. So in future analysis, we still need to uh, check with the teacher evaluation and care evaluation, whether we find also some uh, risk factors in the in the other outliers that do not yet have been identified um, as being a DD suspects or diagnosed. Then um, here I would like to share some more results on the correlations between standardized tests and screening results. And uh, here you see that the reading time in the standardized tests, so this is all only for German, um, do correlate with the reading times that were measured in the experimental screening. Um, and we also do see similar results um, for the accuracy um, in, the, in the various tests that we carried out. And uh, this is not only the case for German that we saw in the previous slide, um, but also in the Italian uh, standardized tests and experimental tests, we see um, the correlation. So um, I will not go into detail with these results. This is just to give you a little overview. And what I want to um, mention or show you is that these findings about, uh, this is showing us something about how it is possible to obtain useful information on reading speed and um, reading accuracy in language and reading tasks um, carried out in a computerized screening. So this already leads me to the, to the conclusion um, of um, this presentation. Um, looking at what we have and what still needs to be done. Um, so in the first place, even though we need to handle the preliminary data carefully, um, the first glance at them is encouraging. But of course, the limitation that we have for now is that we can only use uh, judgment or comprehension tasks because only they can be uh, automatically evaluated. If automatic speech recognition mechanism will improve in the future, maybe other task types can also be implemented. What additionally we still um, need to do is test the reliability and usability of remote testing mode from ch the child's parents and examiner's perspective, because what we've observed when piloting in the remote testing mode, so this was not something included in the studies I've presented, but we've also done some, done some piloting on the remote testing. And what we saw is uh, that maybe children from families with smaller houses or many siblings, old devices and slow internet might be disadvantaged uh, when they're tested remotely. So we need to find out is the remote testing really something that we can uh, continue uh, to do. Also, there are some technical issues that we still need to work on. So there's um, some development needed concerning the compatibility among different browsers and operating system that's um, ongoing. Um, so we do see that the screening results correlate with standardized um, tests. This means that there is potential for the risk identi uh, identification using computerized assessment tool, but we need more data to define the sensitivity and the specificity of these tools. We see practical potential in being able to create new screenings. Um, so that's great that we can always add 
new tasks, uh, new language pairs, and so on and so forth. And also the automatic administration is saving time and resources for the examiner. And also while administering the screenings, the examiner has time for observing the child, which can be very interesting to do because like from a personal experience as a speech therapist, I can say assessing a child is always very busy and actually using computerized tests, it's nice to have the time um, to look at how the child reacts knowing uh, that um, the, the responses will be scored, recorded automatically. Um, in general, um, we saw that the task types and also the illustration, the gamification elements seem to be encouraging for the children tested so far. So this is also encouraging us to continue to work on this pro uh, project and um, this is the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank you um, for your attention and all the collaborators um, who have uh, been involved in realizing this project. So here, the references and thank you very much again. I'm looking forward um, to your questions. Thank you.